Hey YouTube world, Harvest is plenty. Hope all is well. Thanks for stopping by to check out the video. Please don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe. So as the scripture says, God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written. So throughout my time when I was out on them street corners, you know, battling it out with many different people from many different backgrounds, many different faiths and religions, you know, iron sharpens iron. I learned a lot. And there's a lot of common themes that run through uh, people's arguments against Christianity, against Jesus Christ, against the Bible. And there are a lot of them are all the same. You know, Constantine, the Council of Nicaea, Roman Catholic Church, uh, Christians don't uh, know God's real name or true name. Uh, there's Bible contradictions. Uh, Jesus is a copy of Horus and uh, Mithras and Osiris and, you know, just a lot of stuff like that. Um the Bible had many translations, blah, 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 blah. Once you're able to, to read, study, and understand all of those things, you can knock those arguments down in your sleep. Uh, another thing, um, people erroneously compare the Bible to the Quran a lot of times, often, in their debate. Um, but most people don't understand that Muhammad received his revelation to write the Quran from a demon in a cave. And scripture says if any man receives any revelation, from an angel or anybody else that preaches a different gospel and a different Christ, let that be cursed. And, you know, once you understand that, you can knock that document down too. But most people don't understand where the revelation uh, from the Quran comes from. And it hinges on Muhammad. Point blank. Another thing, um, people like to point to pastors in the church and say, well, the pastor he stole money from his congregation, and that's why I don't believe in Jesus. Well, let God be true, but every man a liar. If the pastor stole money, that's the pastor's problem. That's not Jesus Christ's problem. Jesus didn't steal the money. Well, the pastor, he was sleeping with women in the church. If that's the case, then that's the pastor's problem. And that the women that he was dealing with, their issue, that has nothing to do with Jesus Christ or scripture. You know, even not if harvest is plenty, even if I do something, you know, that's totally immoral and wrong, then that has nothing to do with Jesus Christ. That has something to do with me. And that was another argument that I faced on the streets. You know, people would point out to pastor so-and-so doing this and pastor so-and-so doing that. And that's the reason why they don't believe in Jesus Christ. That's the why they don't go. To, that's the reason why they don't go to church or whatever case may be. And that's why they denounce their faith in Christianity. Or that's why they don't follow Jesus. But let God be true. Let every man be a liar. So just want to throw that out as well. Um, but listen to the, this video. Listen to the callers. And again, in all the videos that will be following, it's always those same common themes. Islam, the Quran, Constantine, the Roman Catholic Church, Council of Nicaea, blah, 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 blah. All right. I love you guys. Um, contend for the faith where you can and always stand ready to give an answer to any man that asks about the glorious hope of Jesus Christ. I love you guys. Take care. Be safe. We're at 614-292-8513. Well, um, Ravi, in, in your book, uh, uh, A Shattered Visage, The Real Face of Atheism, you quote Will Durant, and he says, the greatest question of our time is not communism versus individualism, not Europe versus America, not even the East versus West, it is whether man can live without God. What's your answer to that question? I think in a sense that's almost been demonstrated, Fred, as some of the great political tensions of uh, years gone by have been mitigated, at least a lot more people are on the talking table and so on. But when you've got about six billion people in the world and pluralism is a reality and there's a tremendous infusion from all parts of the world, and most of the two-thirds world has a firm religious belief, whatever that belief is, whether one talks about Islam or Hinduism or Buddhism or Sikhism, and that uh, those cultures pouring into the West now and the change is taking place, uh, the North America and North America is going to have to face up to the issue, not only as it sees pluralism, but as it sees the bankruptcy of secularization and all the agony that it has brought about with our breakup of homes, with the violence in the streets, with the emptiness in the lives of our young people, the question is, ironically, on the heels of about 25 to 30 years 
of this tremendous idea of no ethics, no uh, morality going to be taught. We're going to do it on our own. Our society is falling apart. That but, is the question. But, but let, let me, let me. We were talking before the show, and as I mentioned to you, um, uh, looking at the title of your, yeah. your book, "The Real Face of Atheism: A Shattered Visage," some of the most ethical, some of the finest people I know, the most compassionate, the the, the highest people with the highest ideals I know are atheists. Absolutely, no one has ever said that they are not. The question is, there is no rationally compelling reason for them to be ethical. That's the first point. And the second point is, how did you even arrive at the conclusion that it is ethical to be ethical? Where is the point of reference? Well, I can't answer for an atheist where that point of reference is, but perhaps in their hearts they found it necessary to be ethical, to treat people compassionately without reference to a belief but in from God. the rational point of view, if a person comes to the opposite conclusion, how does one de debate between the two? To just say out of my heart, that was Bertrand Russell's position. He operated on the basis of emotivism and feeling. Mm -hmm. And no matter how lofty it signs, it's an irrational position, Fred, and that's what I'm saying. But, but, can, it, but isn't our heart the, the finest place to find our sense of ethics? Well, what about the Nazi regime? They found it in their hearts, too, and ironically, they hanged their, their philosophy on Darwinism. That's what Hitler said in Mein Kampf. If nature determines that the superior is going to obliterate the inferior, then why not humanity, too? Darwin himself saw this coming. Stephen Hawking, one of the greatest scientists alive, says his greatest fear is that if our philosophy is extrapolated from naturalism, that's where we go. But, but what what about the, the devastation of the Inquisition and the Crusades? And they found it in their heart and in their Christian belief to murder. Exactly. That's the point I'm raising with you. But fun, fundamental difference. First of all, let's get the facts straight. When you deal with the havoc that atheism has wrecked, and I'm not trying to be polemic here, let's just be factual. When you deal with the havoc that atheism has raised just through Hitler and through Mao Zedong and through Stalin and Lenin, the numbers are infinitely more than any religious wars have ever produced. In Los Angeles County alone, in one year we kill more than in 15 years in Northern Ireland. Number one point. Number two point is this. Those who in the name of God, in the name of Christ, did bring about violence, Fred, reason not to tell you and me it was the illogical outworking of Christ's teaching. It had nothing to do with Jesus Christ. It had to do with their own political uh, motives. Yeah. But let me finish. But the atheist... It is a logical outworking of man being the measure of all things, because nobody knows which man. Well, I, I would say this. In terms of, of numbers, if we compare the number of people killed by atheists to the number of people killed by Christians or other theists, I don't know how many numbers. We'd come up with millions on, on each side, I'm very no, sure. I can sure, tell you exactly. We have, we, have three million, we have three million Native American Indians killed by mostly Christian believers in the United States. How many more uh, Africans killed in the slave trade? But I think what you're saying is true here. It doesn't have anything to do with true Christian belief, for example, that is to correct. kill, exactly. nor does it have anything to do with the compassionate atheism. It does. It has. It may not have anything to do with the compassionate atheist, Fred, but is the logical outworking of atheism. Atheism basically makes man the measure of all things, and the question is which man? Which person is going to arbitrate between right and wrong? It sounds very noble, but if, as uh, Muggeridge said, if God is dead, somebody is going to have to take his place. It's either megalomania or erotomania, the drive for power, or the drive for pleasure, the clenched fist or the phallus, Hitler or Hugh Hefner. How about your heart? About my heart? I found out I couldn't trust it until I turned it over to Christ. You couldn't? No, sir. Mm -hmm. Because all human beings, however laudable their motives can be, Ultimately, what's wrong with your heart and mine is that it needs redemption, and that's what Jesus Christ taught. And I was raised in a country where there are 330 million deities in the pantheon of just one religion, and it is in the transformation that Christ brings to the human heart that our answer is going to lie. And if our modern society, North America, as Arnold Toynbee would remind, is the first culture that's trying to build its whole system of right and wrong apart from a moral point of reference, and uh, Yorick's revealing its bankruptcy here. Robbie, what do you think uh, in terms of the, uh, you say you couldn't trust your heart until you turned it over to Jesus Christ. Uh, would, what about the Buddha? What about uh, Hinduism? Are, are these uh, religions which you find worthy and estimable and, and uh, uh, worthy of a heart's attention? Very, very good question. First of all, Buddhism is an atheistic religion. It's not a, it's not a theistic religion. Hinduism is not monolithic. It, it swings between pantheism on one side, theism on the other. Here's the best statement I can give to you. All religions are often assumed to be fundamentally the same and superficially different. I would propose it's exactly the opposite. At best, they are superficially the same and fundamentally different. But beyond that, there are many good things, Fred, in many of the religions of the world. There are many good things in many of the philanthropic uh, philosophies of the world. But the culmination of truth as Christ presented himself came in, the, in Jesus Christ himself. Now, the question is not whether you and I like it or not. The question is whether you already spoke of this truth or not. And by definition, truth 
is explicit. What, uh, what am I to make of, of the fact, Ravi, that, that you tell me that the culmination of, mm -hmm. of religious uh, belief and is Jesus Christ? Mm -hmm. But if I were to have an Islamic spokesperson uh, sitting here, or a Hindu, or a Buddhist, they wouldn't agree with you at all, and they'd be equally sincere. Exactly. And by the way, I do a lot of my work overseas. I was in Egypt, Jordan, Bahrain two weeks ago. I have been invited by many Islamic universities, many Islamic countries. I'm one of the few Western-based evangelists that's even been an uh, apologist, even been into Syria. The, that's a vitally important point, but the argument has to settle down in the fact that sincerity alone does not determine truth, hardly. In an academic arena, if all I told my professor of science or history that I was very sincere about my dates, it's too bad you gave me a zero, uh, because he's got a point by which to measure it. So what we do, Fred, is in a very cordial, dialogical fashion, we speak with the highest ranking philosophers of these worldviews, and if one were to draw a line between these, I think you would see the error where some of the other religious systems, while they may assert truth, you can see where the breakdown comes. I think Christianity, when the tr tests of truth are put, uh, is the only system that coherently brings the answers to the four fundamental questions of life, origin, meaning, morality, and destiny, and correspondingly, in each case, will measure up to the truth. Hugh Ross, I know you come at this from the point of view of a scientist, and I want to uh, turn to you in just a moment here. We're at 292 My speakers are from the Veritas Forum, which is being held here on campus this week. Uh, and uh, we're at 292 Norbert joins us on News 820. Good afternoon. you got something very near and dear to my heart, the, the bane of mankind. Let me preface my remarks by stating that man does not need God. God needs man. But in order to exist, God needs man, okay? Now, the thing is, uh, your two guests there, you mentioned Pat Robertson, who's a very sinister, wicked, evil person, uh, who uh, is doing his best to establish a theocracy in, in this country. We just now defeated uh, his henchmen, in the northwest area running for running for a school board and uh... they'll be coming back of course to disrupt the school but we just dis disrupt them uh... uh... first of all this is metaphysical nonsense it's total stupidity religion is nothing more than a man manifestation of man's social existence secondly uh, let me put this to you real clear if you want to win a battle here if you want people to accept you educated people most people are being becoming more educated in the sciences you have to quit this crap okay this metaphysical crap this mythological stuff for, the, for instance, let me, let me point out something to you here. You cannot claim people's loyalty as long as you set yourself in competition with science. You just simply cannot do that. You're going to have to, you can perform a function, sure, but you're going to have to, re, have to surrender your claim to knowledge while emphasizing a moral function, and that's the only way you're going to survive. Nobody buys this flip-flop and crap anymore, and I've had it with all of you people, so get off of it, okay? Thanks, Fred. <laughs> uh, thank you, Norbert. I don't know if you have a response there. <laughs> I'll be glad for you to pick it up, but sure. thank you, sir, for calling. I appreciate your candor. Let me just make one comment. If all religious view is sociologically conditioned, so is yours, and thereby self-negating. But go ahead, Hugh, it's your turn. <laughs> yes, because uh, I think your concern is the scientific credibility of the Christian faith, and you may have some misconceptions about what evangelical Christianity is about with respect to the science. Uh, the book I just brought out deals with the recent measurements astronomers have performed on the universe, and what we discover by those measurements is that the equations of general relativity correctly describe the dynamics of the universe. And when you solve those equations of general relativity, it places the cause of the cosmos outside, independent of length, width, height, time, matter, and energy. Uh, that, by definition, establishes that there's a, some entity that brought the universe into existence in a transcendent fashion. Of all the religions of the world, the Bible is the only book, the only holy book, that teaches that doctrine about creation. But we can push it one step further. Astronomers today can measure 25 separate characteristics of the universe. Each of those characteristics reveals itself to be highly fine-tuned. The slightest variation in any of those characteristics means that it would be impossible for the universe to support life at any time in its history not just life as we know it, but life by any possible conception. When you move to the solar system, the list goes up to 39 characteristics that must be fine-tuned. The degree of fine-tuning that we measure is hundreds of trillions of times greater in several of the parameters and the very best that we human beings can achieve with all of our education, technology, and money. What does that tell us about the Creator? 
he must be personal, because only a person can design to that degree of fine-tunedness. He must be much more creative and intelligent than we are. And some of the characteristics even reveal care and love. For example, the mass of the universe must be exquisitely fine-tuned to get the right elements for life chemistry. That tells us that the Creator cared so much for the human species that he was prepared to build a hundred billion trillion stars and carefully shape and craft those hundred billion trillion stars for billions of years so at this brief moment in time we could all have a nice place to live. And I would submit that establishes not only his personality, but his care and his love for the human species. So, Hugh, you would maintain that there is scientific evidence for the existence of God? Exactly. So, in that sense, you cannot deny that Christianity is a rational faith. I mean, it's based on objective evidence. So if I were to compare the different religions of the world, all except Christianity encourage you to base your faith on subjective evidences. The Bible alone stands apart in saying nothing is to be believed until it's first tested and proven. It encourages to look at objective evidences, history, and science to establish its credibility. Did the scientific evidence in, in your estimation tell you anything about uh, Christianity being particularly uh, 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 rewarding or, or, or the one true religion, or does it say anything about it at all? Well, what you see in the record of nature is the testimony of simplicity, beauty, elegance, and harmony. You know, and, and just that observation that scientists make about the record of nature tells us something about the character of the entity that's responsible for that. You know, when I looked at the holy books of the religions of the world, what I wanted to see is if there was some record that had that same testimony of simplicity, beauty, elegance, and harmony. And I found that in the Bible. I did not find that in the other holy books. You did not find that in the Quran, for example. Well, like in the Quran, what you see is a testimony of vague communication. The frustration is how much of the Quran you have to read to see something specifically enough stated that you can actually subject it to the test. But you do find a few things if you work hard enough. And what you see are uh, statements that are inconsistent with the record of nature and the record of history. And so, so I felt that if God was behind it, he's not going to make mistakes like that. Is your conclusion then that, that God is particularly behind Christianity as opposed to other religions? Particularly behind it, and that the record we see in the Bible is free of those contradictions and errors. Mm -hmm. From Worthington on USA 20, hello, Terry. Yeah, hi. I'm interested in one of the comments your guest made about contradictions mm -hmm. and how you said that the Bible does not contain contradictions. I never said that, but I'll be glad to stand by it. I'm not sure what I you mean. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, are, are you referring, when you say the Bible, are you referring to the Old Testament? Yes. You're not referring to the New Testament? And the New Testament, both. And the fact that the New Testament contains three completely separate descriptions of the crucifixion, which are all different in account and in location, doesn't seem to you to be a contradiction? No, because what you have are three accounts from three different perspectives, neither of which is complete, each giving a partial uh, picture of what took place. You can piece the three together and there's no inconsistency. Okay, so you're saying that the fact that they take place in separate, different locations is not inconsistent? Well, it's like three witnesses to a car accident oh, in three oh, okay. different locations. Okay. Um, then who, and, and those are, are, are the words of witnesses to the crucifixion. Right. So those are not the inspired words of God. No, they are the inspired word of God, but it's inspired through human writers where their, their style of writing is preserved. So if it's, the, if it's the inspired word of God inspired through human writers, and if the people who believe in the Quran believe that theirs is the inspired word of God through human writers, then the fact that the Quran is not literally or, or um, creatively as, as consistent to you doesn't sound inconsistent? Well, let me give you an example. The uh, three Gospels you're speaking of all testify that Jesus was killed upon the cross. Yes, they do, but... One uh, the Islamic faith says that didn't happen. Well, Okay, so th the, there's a difference. Neither does the Jewish faith. However, the Jewish faith uh, is, the, is the faith from which the Old Testament springs. Well, let me give you an example of how you can put that to the test. You can say, well, let's look at what the historians at the time had to say about the death of Jesus of Nazareth. Is it consistent with what the Muslims believe, or is it consistent with what the well, Christians you know, that's believe? A, that's an excellent point, and I'm really glad you brought that up, because what historians say 
from the, the research that I have done, which I would say is rather extensive, is that death by crucifixion took between three and five days. It did not take a few hours. And the fact that from all descriptions of the crucifixion that it only took Jesus a few hours to die on the cross, to me is extraordinarily suspect since it took most people up to three days to die on the cross. But when you look at the testimony of the eyewitnesses, what happened to Jesus of Nazareth before he was placed on the cross? Well, but you yourself have said that all three eyewitnesses have told contradictory reports, so why... No, I didn't say contradictory that? reports. Well, but certainly they're, they're contradictory. Why don't you name the... Con First of all, your terribly, terribly confused in your analogy between the Quran and the Bible, you possibly don't understand. You may mention that the writers of the Quran, there is no there are no writers of the Quran. The Quran was revealed to Muhammad and the only miracle claimed by Islam is the Quran. Now, you have to understand this very clearly. If the only authenticating source is a particular book, Muhammad has performed no miracles in the Quran, as you are aware, and no extra Quranic miracles. The only miracle in Islam is the Quran, which means if the Quran is turned out to be flawed, then there is nothing miraculous about it. There is an intrinsic failure within the sole authentication. Number two, your positioning of the statement that the average person took three days and nobody died before that is categorically false. Oh, I never said no one died before. Then, well, well... I said the average death on the cross took between three days. <laughs> well, to then the fact of the matter is some could die less than that, right? I suppose that's true. And then uh, why not Christ? Could die in more than... Well, that's... I, 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 that's not my, my question. Okay, my question go over. Let's so now you've at least committed two cardinal errors and assumption in your presentation. Let's go to the final one now. Would you name the contradictions for us in between the three gospel writers? In you mentioned the location. Read the passages from the three for me, please, and we'll go over it I for you. I don't have the Bible in front. Well, of me. then you are making an allegation without the evidence in front of you, and I think you have to admit that's not fair. Oh, I would say that if I'm... Well, we're on the air for another several minutes. Why don't you go and get the Bible? I would say if I'm speaking with people who are biblical scholars... Yeah. You don't, but, but then you, I, I don't understand what you mean by the contradiction, because in my Bible I don't see two different locations. You don't see that there are different locations? Absolutely not. The crucifixion, that in one he's crucified in a garden, in another he's crucified in a public place on a hill? No, it never never does it say he was crucified in a garden. All right, we, was, we, we, uh, we have to break for news. Terry, thank you for calling. And, by the way, I've been to that garden. All right, uh, we... Uh, <laughs> We'll be back with our guests after two minutes of news from the Associated Press on News 820. From uh, Westerville, hello, Lola. Yes. You're on the air. Thank you. Um, let me just say, first of all, that Christianity uh, is defined by so many different groups. We have Methodists, we have Catholicism, we have uh, uh, Baptists, we have so on. And they're all correct in their own minds, in their own hearts, and they all think that they're absolutely right. Um, that bothers me because if there is one religion, the Christian religion is the only true one, <laughs> how do you select which one is true? The thing, though, that I'm really appalled by is the fact that this is not a Christian uh, nation, it's a Christian Judeo nation. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. to say that uh, uh, you're an atheist if you don't believe in Jesus Christ, now I was born and raised as a Christian, but I, I don't go to church because I don't believe in the church and what it stands for you hear so many contradictions about what is right and what is wrong what is good and what is evil and so on and i'm just appalled that intelligent well-educated people would be able to come up and make a statement that this is the only true religion or uh, if you don't believe in it you're an atheist it appalls me may i respond to that thank you for calling paula first of all your point is correct not believing in Christ does not make one, uh, if so facto, an atheist. An atheist is one who says there is no God, all right? So we agree on that. An atheist one is one who posits the non-existence of God, which means naturalism, matter, time plus matter plus chance is all that we have to go on. Now, once we admit then the reality that there is a God, then that brings a second line of questioning. How do we know which, which system is true? And unless we use our minds intelligently to decide that, there is no way of arriving at an answer. And as Dr. Ross so clearly pointed out earlier on, the, the, the message in the scriptures is very clear. Test these things, because otherwise you get waylaid and seduced into all wrong beliefs. Now, the third part of the question was that Christianity is not monolithic. It is quite divided up and so on. Yes, that is so. But so are there many other interpretations of other facts and things that we also know to be true. Uh, for example, even if you take a very simple statement 
on uh, any issue politically or whatever. There may be some position that states the situation correctly, but there are many who would differ on opinions on uh, what to accent, what to emphasize. And unfortunately, one of the things that's happened in denominations is where the teaching of a particular individual is either put alongside Christ or supersedes or some little distinctive for which a certain division came about. But may I say this to you? I was in Bahrain uh, two weeks ago. For the first time in their history, all of the churches in the Kingdom of Bahrain, all of them went together in the campaign we held. And more and more you are seeing that what unites the Christian world is stronger than some of the things that deny, that separate them, with one particular difference. I think we need to know this, that in the Christian tradition, and I agree with you that we are inheritors of a Judeo-Christian tradition, but I don't think we are a Judeo-Christian nation. I do think the Judeo-Christian tradition is here that the person and the work of Christ is what defines what Christianity is all about. Is he who he claims to be, and did he accomplish what he said he did for us? Billy Graham was recently in our town, Uh and we saw a tremendous uh, uh, surge of people from all different denominations and religions coming together. And it's a one-shot deal. It really is. Let's face it, uh, Christianity was used to control people back in the days of Constantine. Sure. And uh, that's, for some reason, uh, people uh, live their lives and do the things that they think are okay, and then at their last moment, they think maybe just in case there is a God, I better uh, behave myself. Because, uh, like in the days of Constantine, you'll be punished. Yeah, you you made the point. But, Paula, please bear in mind that there is a difference between what Christianity is supposed to be, between what the Christian faith is supposed to be, and what a carrier. You cannot judge the Christ on the basis of a deviation from his teaching. And, and that's an important distinction. Pardon me? I mean, are we to judge it by what We are to talking? judge it by what the scripture says. Uh, I, you're not to judge it by what I say. I uh, encourage you to take the scriptures. Uh, obviously, you're either going to judge it by what I say or by what you say. Uh, the question is, where's the authority? But the moment you said, people say, this is the only way, I'm assuming that implicit in your argument is that the denial of the only way is the only way. Robbie, let me ask you this. What does the scripture say? We must judge it by this, right? Yeah. What does it say about abortion? Uh, all right, you're trying to, uh, if you move into a completely different arena, the scriptures make, let me first set the parameters, Fred, because I think you need to look at this in two ways. I was at, the, at one of the leading universities, I forget which one, maybe Princeton or one of those, when a woman stood up earlier on and made a comment about the fact that she felt that God was immoral because he killed some and he saved some. A plane crashed, 10 were saved, 20 died. She said, that's an immoral act of an arbitrary God. A few minutes later, she got up to defend her right to determine what to do with the child that was in her womb. If she wanted it, she was going to have it. If she didn't want it, she was not going to have it. And she considered that to be her moral right. So my question to her was, when God plays God, you consider him to be immoral. When you want to play God, you consider it to be a moral right. There's a violent contradiction in the abortion position. Now when euthanasia comes, the person who wants to take her life says, uh, whose life is it anyway? Strange they don't ask the question when the abortion issue comes. But Having had just a minute, Paula, let me, let me, please let me answer Fred here because I don't want to get off the topic here. The important question is this. God has always defined life essentially, not pragmatically, Fred. It is who we are, not what we can do. And the moment we start defining life pragmatically by what we can do, you can be sure the time will come where the slippery slope will put people like you and me or anyone with less ability than anyone else as a less desirable person to live. God considers life absolutely sacred and the dignity of life valid. That's why he respects your dignity. So so, so in your view, Ravi, the scripture says that abortion is wrong. In my view, life is sacred and therefore abortion is wrong. Always wrong. Uh, it is always wrong in terms of the fact that a life is being taken. Now, what you need to say is somebody might come into the room and say, wait a minute, I had to choose between my, my, my life or my child's life. You have immediately raised an indication where you're now not choosing between what to do, do with a life arbitrarily. Or somebody comes in and says, I've been raped by a, by a, a rapist who's got uh, this kind of disease or whatever. Now, you have introduced a new factor into that which I can understand poses tension for the individual. But that That's not the problem America is deciding. That's not what the problem is. Centuries have had to deal with that. We are now deciding whether we can remove a baby at whim. It's got nothing to do with the indications. And that's where I think we have started to play God and we'll pay the price for it as a nation. Lola, one more from you. Oh, I'm just so appalled. I really am appalled. Uh, You can read the Bible and you can interpret it in your way and someone else can do the same thing and interpret it in their own way. 
And there is no right and no wrong. Is that statement basic, right or wrong? Excuse me, I didn't interrupt you, uh, <laughs> except the basic goodness of man. And that does not have to be God-driven. It could be what you feel um, you want to be treated as and, and the, the way you're going to treat others has nothing to do with religion. It has to do with the goodness of man. And I do not believe that's God-driven. Lola, uh, forgive me for interrupting, and I'm sorry about that. You're right that there is a goodness. I am just saying to you that goodness has no point of reference apart from God. The greatest philosophers, from Kierkegaard to Kant to Hume to our modern-day ethicists, have tried it. And what you are seeing now and what I'm seeing now in America is because mankind has tried to define goodness himself or herself. In fact, as uh, the famous ethicist Iris Murdoch said, that where the name of what we are calling good now had its incarnation a long time ago in the person of Lucifer. The moment you make a statement, nothing is either right or wrong, you are assuming that statement is right and not wrong. The moment you say there is a goodness in man, you are choosing upon yourself to choose what is good and what is bad. And, all, and millions of others may disagree with you. I'm just saying to you, if there is a creator, which I believe there is, if there's a moral law giver, which I believe there is, then his moral law has to be a point of reference. Not only do I need a point of reference, I also need the strength to keep it. Our so speakers, thanks for calling. Our speakers are from the very...